Hi everyone, and welcome to today's discussion of The Nature Fix with author Florence Williams. I am Kate Kraft with America Walks, and I'm here with my colleague, Kelsey Carr, who's running tech. And we're also honored today to have Autumn Saxon Ross with us representing Outdoor Alliance for Kids, or often known as OAK. We're really thrilled to be partnering with OAK on this uh, webinar. And Autumn, would you like to tell people a little bit about OAK? Sure, thanks so much, Kate. So the Outdoor Alliance for Kids is a national strategic partnership of over 100 organizations and businesses working to connect children, youth, and family to the outdoors. Since 2010, Oak has succeeded in advocating for policies, programs, and funding that equitably increase access to the outdoors from working with First Lady Michelle Obama on the Let's Move Outside initiative to working with President Obama, establishing the Every Kid Outdoors program. Oak has come together to achieve big wins for youth outdoor access policy. This includes the passage of the Every Kid Outdoors Act, and today, Oak continues to advance the Every Kid Outdoors program, including through their Every Kid Outdoors and State Parks campaign, which aims to extend the federal Every Kid Outdoors pass to state park systems. If you'd like to learn more about how you can join our efforts in making access to the outdoors safe and equitable for all children, youth, and families, please visit www.outdooralliance4kids.org. And lastly, today, hopefully you all are aware that the House is voting for the Great America Outdoors Act. So if you're interested, please look that up to help with deferred maintenance for our national parks. Thank you, Autumn. Before we get started, I want to share a quick note about the technology. You should see a control panel like the one on the screen somewhere on your screen. In today's webinar, we will hear from Ms. Williams for about 30 minutes telling us about the research featured in The Nature Fix, and then we want to follow that with uh, a robust Q&A. So for that to happen, we need your questions. So please use the questions box to submit your questions and comments. We will get to as many of them as we possibly can uh, during our time together. As we are all looking for ways to stay safe and healthy, to provide self-care and reflect on how we can contribute to improving our communities in a post-COVID anti-racist world, we might find that nature has something to offer. Our speaker today will help us understand just what that might be. Florence Williams is a journalist, author and podcaster. She's a contributing editor of Outside Magazine and a fellow at George Washington University Center for Humans and Nature. There's much more that could be said about Florence and I point you to our website for a more detailed biographic statement. But for now, let's hear from Florence. Florence? Hi there. Uh, can you guys uh, see me? We can. Looks great. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, it's great to be here with you. I'm a huge fan of what you do at America Walks. And of course, I'm also a huge fan of Oak, especially the idea of getting kids access to being outside in nature, all kids everywhere. Um, and I, I thought I'd share a little bit about why I wrote this book and some of the takeaways, some of the things I learned from it. Uh, it really started because I used to live in Colorado, where I had this sort of um, really daily access to nature. So I looked a lot like this guy here. Um, there he is. <laughs> and I think some of us looking at this photo can relate to this feeling of being surrounded by nature and feeling pretty good about it. So, you know, I just encourage us all to like take a deep breath right now 
I don't know where you are in your busy day, but just pretend that you're under this tree and how good that would feel. So I felt like this a lot when I lived in Colorado, um, but then my family moved to Washington, D.C., um, where I felt like suddenly I lived in the middle of an asphalt jungle. <laughs> I had to learn how to navigate traffic circles. Um, there were airplanes overhead every 90 seconds. Um, I had this sort of new access to noise pollution <laughs> in a way that I hadn't experienced much before. And I really started to think about what I had lost. Um, what kind of just emotional um, resiliency, a sense of calm, you know, I wasn't having my daily fix of nature. And I was really curious about what the science had to say about that. Like, was nature deficit disorder, um, which is a term popularized by the journalist Richard Louvre, was that a real thing? And what did the science have to say about it? And I was really struck by the fact that, indeed, in large-scale epidemiological studies, it looks like people who live closer to green space just have more access to it. Um, in fact, have these um, pretty remarkable health benefits. So this large study looking at 400,000 people in Holland found a lower incidence of 15 stress-related diseases among people who live closest to green space, um, lower mortality rates in the UK, um, higher gestational birth weights, healthier babies, also lower symptoms of attention deficit disorder in kids living closest to green space. Um, and from this Harvard study, a 13% drop in depression um, in people who lived closest to green space as opposed to who lived farthest away from it. I mean, this is all after adjusting for income and education. Um, and, and so this is such a, a huge health benefit. Um, it's sort of, um, um, it's no wonder actually that doctors are starting to prescribe time in nature. Um, and so we're seeing this kind of slowly take off in the United States. It's been more popular in places uh, like Japan uh, and parts of Europe. Um, but now we're seeing, I think it's something like 72 uh, clinics in the United States are now actually prescribing time outside to their patients. Uh, but no one seems to really know exactly why our brains and our bodies feel better when we're outside. And so that's something I really wanted to look at in the book. And there are a lot of really interesting theories about this. For example, there's something about the color green that makes us feel um, more vital. When we see the color green, our brains and our nervous systems sort of calm down, um, which is really interesting. And it's probably because we deeply evolved in these natural environments. We know that where there's greenery, there's probably food. There's a way that we can survive. Um, and also, if you look at this photo, there's some really interesting patterns, right, that we see in nature. And studies have shown that when we look at fractal patterns, which are patterns that repeat at scale, um, our brains produce different kinds of alpha waves and other brain wave states that seem to induce um, a sense of calm. Here's fractal patterns that we see in clouds. Um, so you don't have to be in the middle of a forest or a wilderness area to find um, necessarily some beautiful patterns. You can see them just by looking up wherever you are. Um, and this is Dr. Ching Li, who works at the University of Tokyo. He's really convinced that there's something about the aerosols emitted by vegetation, such as cypress trees, um, that seems to lower our blood pressure. Um, it actually increases killer immune cells, natural killer cells in our immune system. Um, and those cells can remain elevated up to 25% for up to 30 days. I went to Japan to see some of this research and process, and I was really surprised to find out that some of these nervous system changes we're seeing after just 15 minutes of walking uh, around in a forest. And at first I was a little bit skeptical of this because I thought, well, it's exercise, right? People are getting exercise. Um, we know that exercise is linked to greater feelings of well-being, to greater health. Um, but the researchers tried to control for that by sending people to walk the same amount of time and distance in an urban area. Um, and they saw these tremendous benefits um, really just in the nature walkers. So they saw this 2% drop in blood pressure, 4% drop in heart rate, and up to a 16% decrease um, in the stress hormone cortisol. So it sounds like some of these instant benefits, the 15 minutes, um, are partly derived from our nervous systems really becoming engaged on a sensory level. 
And so I have tips that I like to talk about for how we can sort of quickly shortcut um, to some of these benefits in our own nervous systems. And so I really encourage people when they do walk outside in nature, first of all, put your phones away, <laughs> put them in your back pocket. We don't want to be thinking about um, technology or thinking about the things that we need to do um, necessarily later in the day. We want to anchor ourselves really in the present moment. And so I tell people, take a deep breath, look, listen, and touch. Really have an interactive experience um, in the environment where you find yourself. So what I often do is I'll just grab a handful of leaves um, or pine needles, I'll crumble them up and I'll smell them. Um, you know, our, our nose is the sort of direct pathway to our brain. And when we, we smell certain wonderful sense of nature, it really can take us instantly um, to kind of the, the space of restoration. Um, and of course, if you close your eyes, you are more able to access um, some of those other senses that we don't always get to pay attention to. Uh, and of course, people like to talk about dose. You know, what happens if you spend more than 15 minutes outside? And so I was really drawn to this idea um, that's popularized by um, the University of Virginia, um, by the Biophilic Cities Institute there, an initiative. Uh, and you know, they've looked at different doses and, and, you know, starting with the tippy top of the pyramid, this is kind of based on a food pyramid. Um, so that, you know, the top is kind of the dessert, <laughs> you know, the really special, the special treat that we may not get to very often. Um, and, you know, once we go to the set, the middle of the pyramid, that may be more kind of uh, day trips, maybe to a park. Um, or half day trips or picnics. And then sort of the bread and butter of the pyramid is really kind of urban nature, which is where most of us live. So I'll quickly just run through some of those, some examples from that. Um, this is the Green River in Utah. This is a photo from uh, an 1870 expedition by Major Powell. And I love this photo because I think it just really shows how <laughs> when we are surrounded by vast, nature. Um, it can really make us feel small. Uh, and that humility is actually really, really good for us psychologically. It's something that living in American culture, um, we're not necessarily um, encouraged to experience very often. Um, and yet it makes us feel more connected to the world around us. It also makes us, it turns out, makes us feel more connected um, to other people. When we feel like our ego is just a little bit smaller in the presence of something grand and beautiful. And of course, it's also a time for us to really reflect on who we are, who we want to be, what our place is in society. So you see a lot of these multi-day wilderness um, kind of experiences throughout cultures and throughout time, these rites of passage. Um, and then of course, there are certain times in all of our lives when we just feel like we need some time and space to recover. For example, um, this is a veteran on a, on a veteran's trip that I went on to report about. And um, people who have trauma, who've experienced trauma or grief are often greatly helped by extended periods of time outside um, where their nervous systems can kind of calm down a little bit and they can start to really open up to um, these wonderful features and sights and smells of nature. And of course, there's some really interesting science going on during some of these wilderness trips. Um, this is a veteran, and he's having his brain waves scanned in the wilderness. Um, and what some of the interesting pilot data has shown is that there are certain brain waves, especially in our frontal cortex, which is kind of the thinking, doing, task-oriented parts of our brains that really quiet down in nature. Um, because we're not answering email and, and we're not necessarily working on a specific task. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to talk about if, if that part of our brain is quieting, where is all that brain activity going instead? And some of the theories or suggestions are that perhaps it's going to parts of our brains associated with self-concept, um, associated with empathy, um, associated with creativity. Uh, of course, I am a huge fan of children being outside. This is a nature preschool that I visited in Scotland. Um, so this would be more like the center of the pyramid. People who are spending um, a lot of time outside, but not necessarily 24 seven um, outdoors. There's a lot of evidence now that children who spend a lot of playtime in nature 
um, are more comfortable sort of with social and emotional regulation. They're comfortable being part of teams. Um, they're comfortable using their imaginations. They are comfortable soothing themselves um, and partly finding just comfort in nature, which it turns out can be really a lifelong skill um, that then they'll be able to call upon. Uh, and of course, we know when kids are outside, they are really able to access their sense of wonder, which is so natural for kids, um, and their sense of curiosity. Um, but of course, the challenge for us <laughs> is that most of us don't live very close to beautiful na natural areas necessarily. Um, and so the challenge is how we find nature where we live, how we find it where we are. 70% um, of Americans now live in cities. Um, how do we provide that access um, to everyone? And, and it turns out that um, access to nature is really a social justice issue. So here is my city, Washington, DC. Um, I think this is Autumn City too. And what you can see in these 20, 24 years is that there's been this tremendous loss of tree cover uh, in, in the city. And it turns out you can see poverty from space. So you can see that wealthier parts of the district still have a lot of tree cover uh, and other parts of the city that are more underserved do not have that access to greenery. Um, and of course, that access is really important, not just for sort of um, um, emotional well-being and stress reduction, but also for things like the urban heat island effect. So we see that as global warming increases, this is going to be, uh, you know, a sort of bigger issue that some neighborhoods are going to soon be literally hotter than others. Um, this is a really interesting project by the Trust for Public Land. And what they're doing is they're mapping different cities for um, access to parks. And so the red, this is Houston. Um, Houston, 60% of the population lives within a 10 minute walk of a park, but 40% does not. And if you look at the country as a whole, 100 million Americans do not live within a 10 minute walk of a park. So the hope is that by mapping some of these, what they're calling park deserts, sort of like food deserts, um, policymakers can really have some data to figure out where to invest uh, in more parks and, um, and sort of make better, better decisions to make access um, more equitable. Um, of course, now during the time of coronavirus, we all are feeling the need to be outside. Um, we understand confinement in a way that we haven't necessarily before. Um, and we are facing greater levels of stress and anxiety. So there was recently a poll from the US Census showing that during the months of April and May, Americans reported um, up to um, three times as much anxiety and depression uh, as they normally would. And, and that ends up being a third, fully a third of Americans uh, were reporting high levels of anxiety and depression. Um, and yet we know that being outside can reduce anxiety up to 62%, um, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, I, I wanted to just include a couple of photos that I've taken just really on my block in Washington, D.C. Um, fortunately, I still have a couple of trees <laughs> here. And um, I, I wanted to emphasize that nearby nature can be very rich. Uh, and even though I moved here from Colorado and I was a big snob about nature being inadequate uh, on the East Coast, it turns out that actually you can find um, incredible access to nature, incredible moments of beauty and awe. Um, and these moments are really, really important even for generating micro doses of stress reduction. Um, and so, so again, yeah, I think if we can train ourselves to sort of be in the present moment and to look for moments of beauty, um, that can be incredibly helpful. Um, also to look for patterns, look for color, um, watch the seasons of nature change. And so I just, I'm ending with um, a few more tips that I have for sort of how to take advantage of and optimize nearby nature. Um, and, and the science is really behind uh, these ideas. Um, one is that there's just kind of um, terrific light in the morning that helps us reset our circadian rhythms. Um, this is really important for being able to sleep well and for other bodily systems kind of working optimally. Um, and when you're inside, to work near natural daylight. So put your desks near a window, um, make sure that you look up 
from your Zoom calls uh, often to look out at the windows. Um, maybe keep a pair of binoculars handy so you can catch um, those moments of awe uh, when a bird lands outside your window. Um, and also to really think about when you are going outside to go to places that might have less noise. So noise is strongly associated with levels of stress and anxiety, especially when there are chronic exposures to noise. Um, our cities are somewhat somewhat quieter now, you know, than they have been. And so I encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, and similarly, to walk along streets that have more trees. Um, find the nature-rich areas if you have to drive somewhere. Um, or if you're if you're finding a route, you know, to walk in your neighborhood, go for the trees. Uh, of course, again, access to nature for kids. We need to lobby our school districts for greener schoolyards, um, for more recess. Um, I know in my city, something like only 10% of kids were getting the recommended amounts of recess uh, in public schools, which is a shockingly inadequate number. When you do go outside, take children with you. Uh, think about eating outside, taking breaks outside, and um, don't forget to cultivate those moments of awe. So that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Let's, uh, Florence, let's all get on camera here. We already have a few questions coming in over the transom here, but I'm going to turn it to Autumn for the first question. Thanks so much, Kate. And so uh, this book was really great. It's like all of the stuff you've he you've heard on the news or different articles all in one place. So thanks so much for telling us how uh, getting started, how you uh, came to start this book. And so the first question I have for you, you know, thinking and reading the chapter on social forestry um, and the and the recommendations of applying those learnings to medical and insurance fields in other countries. I was really struck by the fact that here in the US, you know, we've had a parks and forestry infrastructure for almost over a century now. And we haven't really thought of how to integrate it into larger systems within our society. So thinking, you know, all that you know, all that you've learned now that you've acclimated to the, the beautiful greenery of DC and the city we share, um, what are some recommendations that you'd have for us, you know, to maximize the benefits if we think about, you know, education, if we think about these larger structures, like where, yeah. where can, should we start? Well, Autumn, I think you're asking that question exactly the right way, which is that if we want this idea and these benefits to sort of get to scale, we need to start looking at the institutional level. So how do we get schools to embrace this? How do we get the healthcare system to embrace it? How do we get city planners um, to embrace it? Um, neighborhood designs, um, public housing projects, these are all really um, critical in terms of reaching a lot of people. We can't just expect parents to take the full responsibility, for example, to get their kids outside in nature. Um, we need these other institutions to do it. Um, and so I think that school change doesn't really happen unless parents get involved. Uh, and I think the same is true with city planning. Um, here's where democracy becomes really, really critical. I think we have to lobby on behalf of our children and be on behalf of our nature access. Um, and we have to show that this is a, show, a social justice issue. This is a racial justice issue. Um, we have to I, I just insist that, that we look at these benefits more broadly once we actually start to believe that the benefits are real. And so I think there's a role for the science and the evidence, but I think that that is starting to really become quite overpowering. And now it's a question of how do we jump it to the policy level? Thanks, Florence. Um, as you know, many of the people listening today are involved in creating streetscapes and parks and a lot of the city uh, development. Can you talk about the things in nature that they should try to replicate to get that kind of benefit on a streetscape? And I know in the book you talk a lot about uh, Singapore, so maybe give some examples from what, maybe not the bad examples, but the good examples of what you mentioned there. I think Singapore is a really interesting example because um, they're not only looking at access to green space as being important, but they're looking at biodiversity as an index 
So, um, for example, originally in Singapore, um, you know, something like a million trees were planted, but they were all kind of largely a few varieties <laughs> of trees. And this was, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, and now there's this recognition that that actually we need to, um, you know, plant native species uh, if, if we want them to have sort of a special, fun, you know, functionality for things like, um, you know, stormwater runoff. I mean, once you start to green cities, there are so many benefits beyond just the social and emotional ones. Um, so it makes sense, I think, to bring in as many experts and stakeholders and neighbors and people who live on these streets and live in these blocks. Um, what do the people who live there want? It's going to be different in different neighborhoods. Um, you can't just exclude residents from these sometimes very complicated um, discussions because if you do make a neighborhood beautiful and you green it up, then you have another host of problems associated sometimes with gentrification. Um, and we've seen that prices going up. Um, so these are multi, multi-layered, um, complicated discussions that need to happen. But in terms of just the elements of nature, you know, again, biodiversity, bringing in birds, bringing in natural water sounds, um, greenery, um, but also in a way that feels safe. So um, lines of sight are really important if we want people to use these areas and parks. Um, lots, lots and lots of, of, of points of conversation. So, and, and this is a question that's coming in. If, if you think about your tips, right, for us to access, if you think about biodiversity, um, you know, we have so many cities, you know, one of the benefits of DC is that regardless of where you are, you're pretty close to a park. Like you're within um, a half a mile of a park, regardless of what you look like or what your income is, right? It's the quality of the park and maybe the programming that's different. And so, what are what are some of the the quick hits like you know for other cities that are looking to provide these benefits in these small park pocket parks pocket parks um, like what like the top four or five things that you need to have there if you have like a block of space that you want to definitely make uh more healthy and more accessible for that community you know again i i'm not sure there's a one size fits all answer to that uh, I think it really depends on the community. It depends on the residents. It depends on what their needs are. Um, I I'm a fan of facilitating exercise, you know. Um, and but but I think location is kind of the almost the biggest conversation starter. You know, where are those park deserts? Where do people need? Uh, a little bit of open space and where can we provide that? And then how do we make it inviting? I mean, that's really the key. There's no point in having green space and having public space if no one's gonna use it. And that's why it's so inc incredibly important to talk to the community um, about what they want. Um, if they don't feel you know, that they've had uh, you know, some say in it, they're just not gonna use it. Um, again, I'm a big fan of you know, biodiversity, of birds, of water features, um, and, and a, a feeling of safety. So I think all, those are really critical elements that need to come in. We've had a number, a few questions around whether or not mental health professionals are using park prescriptions and anything you know about um, outdoor or nature programs for children that are in foster care. Wow. Um, I would say that there is a growing recognition among mental health care workers and clinicians that time in nature is really important. Uh, and I, I think that it's not enough. <laughs> I think that most most clinicians, when they're trained, are not taught this. They're not really taught that this is a sort of viable option. They're taught, I think, to focus on sleep and medication and diet. There, there are so many forms of, of um, self-care. But I, I think nature is often, um, unfortunately, left out of the equation. And, and part of that is we have a generation of Girl Scout leaders, of teachers, of parents, of clinicians who themselves were disconnected from nature. So we're now on two or three generations of Americans who have been sort of, you know, off the farm and not really um, spending much time outside. So there's kind of this broken chain that we have to put back. Um, I am aware of programs for some homeless kids in Chicago. Um, I know that there, there's a veteran there who's trying to get kids outside who are, are um, at least in shelters. Um, I'm not really specifically aware of, of ones for foster kids, but I think that that's probably a great need. 
Yeah, and there's actually, DC has right on the Potomac, about an hour and a half south of the city. It used to be an overnight residential camp that the city used to run. And last summer, for the first time, or maybe the summer before, they opened that back up just for homeless children or children experiencing homelessness. So DC does have a camp in recognizing the importance of providing opportunities and rest um, for some of our most vulnerable kids. So it's, it's something that we need to do and it's always good to hear when municipalities are definitely prioritizing that when we think about, you know, holistic care of our young people. And so, you know, I consider when I was younger, I was a city kid, so my first experience was my grandmother's backyard or a city park and didn't experience Yosemite until I was almost 40. You know, and so in your book, you talk about how nature is hard to define. And often nature is these huge places over there, a plane went right away and not our backyard or this nearby nature. Um, have you come across other words um, that may resonate with other folks to start to bring more people along um, on, on this journey that you're you're definitely a great advocate for for all of us. Yeah, it's interesting you ask that because I, I can't tell you how many people I've run into who have said to me, oh, I'm not a nature person. I don't really like nature. Um, I just, I'd love to go to the beach um, or I like to garden. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, wait, that is actually nature. Right? <laughs> um, and so I think we all need to have a kind of more generous definition for what nature is. Uh, and, and there's a study um, by Case showing that children, if you ask them what's nature, um, they will say, oh, it's like this crack in the sidewalk where I found an earthworm. Um, or, you know, it's, it's like the fence out here where a butterfly landed. Um, you know, they have a very generous definition of nature because they're able to still see it. They're able to see beauty in these small spaces. Whereas if you ask a grown up what's nature, they say, oh, it's Yosemite. Um, and that, of course, is an instant, you know, it's, it's an inhibition for people to get out into nature if they think that's what's required, you know, is a big plane trip to Yosemite. So what I'm hearing is you're just saying that we should never grow up and that'll <laughs> help us maybe all have the right to access our inner children for sure. <laughs> um, we have some people who are interested in whether or not biking in nature it would give you the same benefits as walking in nature? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's very individual. If you love being on your bike in nature and it brings you joy, then that is fantastic for you and please do it. Um, you know, there are some people who listen to their podcasts um, while they're walking in nature or they listen to a playlist that will help them run. Um, it depends what your goal is. If your goal is fitness, then that's totally fine. But I would say if you are feeling stressed out um, and you are feeling the need to sort of calm down, I would recommend taking the earbuds out because the science just shows that when we can engage all of our senses, when we can really hear the sounds of nature and smell and feel these these elements of nature um that's going to actually bring us emotional restoration so notice how you feel when you're outside during different activities pay attention you know we're not very good actually at paying attention to how we feel um sort of body awareness we're, we, we americans are just not great at it um but i think that we can learn to be better at it and we can learn by nature you know nature can actually help teach us yeah, so we've had a couple of questions around safety. So I'm going to give you a two part, you know, in this time of COVID, recognizing that it's probably better for all of us to be outside where they're alone or in smaller groups. You know, what, what is some of the research or what are maybe some of the talking points we can start to use to help folks recognize how nature can help us more so now than probably ever? And then the second part is, we think about, you know, so many folks, and I think about especially being a woman and sometimes our gendered approach and fear in the outdoors of diseases or ticks or getting dirty or, you know, some of those things. So, you know, how do we promote um, getting over, you know, helping folks overcome that initial fear of nature that maybe they got when they were younger from other folks? Okay, those are both great questions. Um, I guess I would start out in terms of the first question of just emphasizing that 
um, the science is really coming in that outdoor transmission of COVID is is very um, it's very improbable. It's just pretty rare and. Um, and so I am really passionate about the idea of moving classrooms outside, moving clinics outside, um, moving eating establishments outside. We, you know, we need to move, and it takes an incredible amount of imagination to start thinking about how do you move a classroom outside. Um, but the damages of not doing it are really, really great, right? Keeping these kids home, um, keeping their parents away from productive work, um, you know, exposing children and their teachers and staff uh, to the virus of indoor classrooms. I mean, you know, it's just worth it. It's worth putting in the sort of thought and creativity for how we can move more of these activities outside. Um, in terms of, you know, going for walks with friends, you know, I, I went on one this morning. We stayed six feet apart from each other. We wore our masks. We went on an hour long walk. It was terrific. Um, and it also, that walk I took this morning kind of addresses the second question, um, which is that I walked in Rock Creek Park, the big urban park. Um, it's it's kind of a scary place. There, there's some, some you know people get get mugged, they get raped. They think bad things happen sometimes in Rock Creek Park. I feel much safer as a woman going with a friend. Um, and so uh, I think there's safety in numbers, especially if you're someone who's trying to get comfortable with the idea of, of being kind of in the deep woods and you're not maybe used to it or you live in a, in a city with a lot of crime, um, you know, definitely safety in numbers. And um, also I would recommend that people kind of start small, you know, start just sitting outside, maybe sit on a bench, maybe just listen to the birds, maybe just look at the sunset. Um, you can start small in terms of loving nature. It doesn't have to be a big expedition. Um, and then in terms of like the fears of ticks and wild animals and things like that, um, those risks are real. Uh, we live in a place with a lot of Lyme disease, um, but there are precautions that you can take and, you know, you can go to CDC website and, and find out what some of those are. Um, but I would also emphasize that the risks of not going are great. So if we stay home, if we keep our kids home, um, there are perils in that. There are diseases of the indoors, and we're seeing these diseases rise at epidemic proportions in our kids, right? We're seeing obesity, we're seeing diabetes, we're seeing anxiety, we're seeing depression. Um, these are really diseases of the indoors. Yeah, and just just to tag on that, we and at Nature Bridge, we try not to talk about safety. We we talk about calculated risk, right? Like being outdoors, being with people, and even more now than ever, it's not about safety. It's about what risks can we take to ensure that there's some type of gain, whether it's social, whether it's health, whether it's being outside. So that's something that we're thinking about is not, not playing into fear, but letting folks know that life is about calculated risk and how can we support that with each other and with young people. And there are organizations too that exist to help people get outside together, not just kids, but adults too. So, you know, organizations like Outdoor Afro, there's Girl Trek, um, you know, there are sort of local walking groups and meetup groups. If you're an adult, there are ways to find companions to go with outside. Yeah. Uh, you talk about this a lot in your book and we've had some questions around it, just the difference between actual nature exposure in something more artificial um, pictures of nature and the same thing about soundtracks of nature versus actually being in nature and but in sort of a second part to that there's also a number of things in your book that are prescriptive like five hours a month in nature and the five minutes a day of bird songs can you just talk about that as well um, yes. Why don't I start start with that? Um, different studies have tried to look at this idea of dose um, for these specific recommendations. So there was a, a couple studies in Finland looking at depression, showing that people who got outside for five hours a month, um, which is really just like twice a week, you know, 30 to 40 minutes uh, in a park, those people were able to actually prevent mild depression. Um, so there was something about five hours a month. If you could go more than that, great, but that was kind of like the minimum for preventing depression, but that was in Finland, you know? Um, in the UK, there was another study um, showing that they were more stressed out, I guess maybe because of Brexit or who knows what, but they seemed, this just came out last summer, they need two hours a week. 
So that's eight hours a month. They need more nature in the UK. Um, <laughs> in terms of the five minutes of bird song, you know, really, who knows? I, I think there's tremendous variation. I think there are individual needs. Some days you wake up and you're like, ah, I'm so stressed out. I need more than 30 minutes of nature. Um, or you go through some, you know, difficult life experience, right? Um, or a different, difficult global <laughs> health crisis. And you're, you're going to need more time to spend working on restoration and recovery and stress reduction. So again, it's, you know, how do you feel? How do you feel when you're outside? Pay attention, do what you love. Maybe you don't love the, uh, love the ocean. You know, maybe the, looking at the ocean doesn't do it for you. You like to be um, in a very protected bower of beautiful trees. Know what you love and do it. I'm sorry, what was the first part of the question? Natural nature versus artificial. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I was skeptical of virtual nature at first. I was like, does, does that really make people feel good? Um, but it turns out it does. So there are still benefits to virtual nature. And there have been studies in prisons um, looking at, um, you know, people who are under, um, you know, maximum security, who are in solitary confinement. Um, some of the prisoners are assigned to a, a workout room with a nature video playing. Some are assigned to a regular workout room. Um, and it turns out that, you know, the ones who are in with the nature videos are, feel a lot better. There are, you know, fewer violent incidences or fewer outbursts, um, fewer times when guards need to be called in. So at first, the guards apparently in this one prison in Oregon were against the idea of playing beautiful nature videos. Um, you know, for incarcerated people. And then they decided, actually, we like having these nature videos because it's easier for us if there aren't as many violent incidences in the prison. In the prison. So um, I was surprised that, that nature videos can be helpful, um, but they can. And in fact, that's why, you know, Apple Computer puts these beautiful screensavers on their computers and names their operating systems, things like um, Yosemite. Um, you know, we do respond to nature images, even if it's not real. Yeah, so in, in, in your book, and there are so many studies, you know, especially with children and ADHD, but in your book, you also talk about organizations that are using nature when it comes to addressing trauma and PTSD. Um, you know, what, what are some of those lessons and are you aware of other um, kind of group studies like that, that are specifically thinking about like domestic violence and child abuse and um, natural disasters, kind of taking those learnings and applying them to other um, populations that are su suffering from similar um, yeah. issues. Yeah, I'm really interested in trauma. Um, the research is still a little bit thin. It's very hard to do. Um, it's hard to do, you know, field studies that are sort of, you know, double blind and, you know, case controlled um, with large sample sizes. There's a lot of anecdotal data that it's helpful. Um, there's a lot of theoretical work um, showing that, um, you know, it, it's calming and soothing and sort of self-confidence building to be outside in nature. Um, you know, for, for women who've experienced violence and trauma, um, being outside in nature can be a way to sort of um, feel more comfortable with sensation, um, feel more connected to your body in a positive way. Um, some of these programs have been incredibly successful. They've been very successful with veterans with PTSD. Um, uh, I think that it, there's, there still needs to be some harder science, and I, I think that there are groups and there are researchers trying to do that work. Um, I know you talk about hospitals a bit in your book. Uh, it, can you talk a bit about the best practices for how hospitals can include nature and some of the research that you talk about in terms of rape? Uh, hospital nature and getting better. Yeah, I, I visited a very nature rich hospital in Singapore for the book. I was really fascinated by how um, the rest spaces and the gardens uh, incorporate these kind of biodiversity indexes. There are sort of these healing gardens uh, in this hospital. There's a rooftop farming program. Um, 
there are some really interesting studies showing that, of course, healthcare workers are, are some of the most stressed out workers in America, uh, not just right now, but, but in general. And uh, when they can take a break in a garden or a nature-rich space, even if it's a room with a lot of plants in it, um, when they go back to work, they're making fewer mistakes, they're less stressed out. Um, so I think that that's a really interesting set of studies that have come out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, so it's not just the patients, you know, who are helped by nature in hospitals, but the but the doctors and the nurses as well. And and I also think that there's some really interesting imagery that has been used in the design of this, this especially one guard uh, one hospital I visited, where you know the wallpaper and the photographs are designs from nature. Um, it seems that when patients are in hospital rooms that look out into, into um, spaces, spaces with trees or grass, they actually request less pain medication. They get released from the hospital earlier. Um, and, and Florence Nightingale noticed this, you know, 150 years ago, that patients would sort of naturally turn their heads to the light. Um, when they were sick in bed. And so there's something that our bodies really crave and understand about nature that seems to be very healing. So um, I know you focused on urban areas and you know, if we look at the data that more folks are, are moving towards urban areas, but um, you know, in public health, we're starting to really try and parse out the difference in urban and rural areas. And so have you come across any research or you have recommendations, you know, because we're seeing such a striking difference in access to health care, um, access to healthy foods, you know, we're seeing a lot of the, um, the stress and the adverse health conditions in urban populations we're now seeing um, in rural populations. And so Thinking about that, do you know of research or thinking about how your work can impact folks that are returning to these rural um, spaces to really um, try and reconnect with, you know, maybe their original community, but how can this work really help folks that are in some of these rural areas? Yeah, I think there are really two, two points to that question. Um, one is that just because you live near nature doesn't mean that you are immune um, from uh, negative health problems. So you're right, Autumn. I mean, we're seeing that the deepest health problems in America are in rural areas. So there's more depression there. There's more um, suicide. Um, and, and a lot of that be is because of access to health care. It's because of um, cultural access to mental health and physical access to mental health. Um, and it's because of wealth. So in the United States, wealth is the main, single main determinant of health. Um, rural areas don't have access um, to wealth um, as cities do. And so, in fact, people who live in cities tend to be healthier. Um, they also tend to have better education. Um, they tend to have better jobs. So, you know, I'm in no way against cities. I think that, you know, cities are wonderful places to live and, you know, we need cities if we're gonna be a sustainable, um, you know, society. Um, but I do think we have to figure out how to extend the healthcare benefits of nature even to rural areas where just because you live there doesn't mean that you are um, you know going into restorative spaces um, you're you're maybe not you're you're still at home you're still plugged into your devices um, you don't have the sort of social supports that might encourage you to go outside uh, and, and these are all lessons that that people in rural areas need just as much as people in urban areas a similar kind of adding on to Autumn's question, what's the science around how nature helps with loneliness um, or does, you know, especially for older adults? Yeah, um, I, I don't know if there are a lot of studies actually specifically looking at how nature addresses loneliness. There are studies looking at seniors and time spent in nature um, that show that, for example, dementia symptoms are reduced uh, after time in a garden. Um, stroke victims, stroke patients um, sometimes do better and progress more quickly if their therapy is done outside and in gardens. Um, I know from just some of you know, the literature I've read that just being um, among elements of nature, being among trees, for example, um, can make people feel 
sort of supported and part of a community in nature. So I have heard people say that they don't feel lonely when they're in a forest um, because they feel connected you know, to nature, and which I think is a really interesting idea. I don't know um, how much has actually been empirically studied. Yeah, so and part of your talking in your book, and it's so funny, I'm reading emergent strategies as well. And so it's like I'm being slapped around with this idea of fractals <laughs> and never <laughs> thought about it before. But, you know, you talk about fractals, you talk about design and how we naturally um, are drawn to that. Um, and so are there suggestions or do you know of efforts where planners, designers, park professionals have used this idea of fractals? Um, in their designs as a natural calming and nurturing space for, you know, folks that are engaging with, with either that space or that building? Uh, great question, Autumn. I, you know, very little. There is certainly a movement in architecture, um, you know, towards biophilic design uh, and bringing more elements of nature into, for example, workspaces. So sometimes you'll see a water wall or you'll see a green wall. Um, where I think sort of accidentally, you know, there are a lot of patterns and textures and even to some degree, some, some smells um, and some sounds. But I, I don't know of anyone who's really specifically looking at, um, you know, like fractal density in the design of a, you know, of a green wall. I think it's a good idea. I think just naturally a lot of, you know, like carpeting, for example, you know, um, does incorporate some fractal geometry just because intuitively, you know, it's kind of appealing. Um, we have some people who want to know if gardening and in particular community gardening can give you the benefits of being in nature. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there are some wonderful programs out there, therapeutic programs, um, working with community gardens. Um, I know of um, there are programs uh, in Denver, for example, um, working with immigrant communities, also in Salt Lake City, looking at refugee communities um, in California. We're seeing that, too. Um, it's a great way, I think, to, uh, you know, incorporate some um, sort of more conventional therapy, but kind of disguise it a little bit. So, you know, for example, just being w among a group of people, uh, working in a common goal, um, kind of, uh, again, you know, working on some mindfulness, how to feel like you're in the present, maybe telling stories of, you know, the culture that you left, um, cooking with foods from the garden that might remind you of home. So I think some of these um, these refugee programs have been really, really helpful. Yeah, and we've had a few questions talking about this, um, this new world we're in where everything is virtual. And, um, you know, as a teacher, as a parent, you know, I think about, you know, you had your first shift, shift and second shift, and now it's just all one shift without that transition or rest. And do you know of studies or have recommendations of, you know, how do you break it off? How do you, knowing that your children now, right, you're advocating for them to be on the screen more because they have to do school there. Like, what, what are recommendations for all of us as we're learning? You know, is there like a sweet spot that it's like 30 minutes on screen and then five minutes outside? Or how do we start to think about creating yeah. a new balance in this new world? You know, I, my first advice to parents would be cut yourself some slack. Like, don't freak out about it. Like, these are strange times and you're trying to survive, you know, and it's okay if your kids are going to be on screens more than you think they should be for a little while. Um, you know, sooner or later, life's going to return to normal. Um, so don't beat yourself up. That's my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice is take care of yourself, parents. So make sure that you get a break too, where you can go outside and you can have some time to breathe, um, which will make you a better and more patient parent. Um, and then, okay, yes, figure out how to help your kids have a sort of balanced diet. So I've heard people talk about, you know, the media nature diet, um, like a food diet. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of junk food, you know, that you're gonna find on your phone or on your screen but we need the nutrients too. And so we do need these hits of authenticity. Um, we need hits of, um, you know, 
exercising all of our sensory systems outside, which will help us sleep better. I saw a study recently came out showing that in kids as young as um, eight and nine, the more time they spend on screens, the worse sleep they're getting. Uh, you know, I mean, again, now it's just, they're gonna be on a lot of screens, but again, if you can get them outside in the early morning light, and maybe if you can get them outside to watch the sunset, maybe go look at the moon, maybe walk the dog in the evening. Um, this can kind of help them decompress a little bit from all of that sort of artificial light and help reset their circadian rhythms. We are fast approaching the top of the hour and we do want to have an opportunity to give away a couple of your books. We've had um, uh, we were fortunate enough to get a couple of copies. So, uh, Kelsey, who who wins the books this time? Yeah, so we've got two lucky giveaway winners. Um, we have Maria Trevino and Freddie Summer. So we will be reaching out to you two via email after this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Florence. We really appreciate you sharing uh, your research and your ideas with us. Thank you, Autumn, for being with us uh, today and making this a most enriching conversation. I'm gonna go back to my slides here. Uh, if you guys can come off camera for a minute. Um, I wanna have an opportunity to uh, just meant to thank our sponsors. Uh, none of this could be done without our sponsors, so we'd like to thank them. They're, they're listed there on the screen. And if you enjoyed today's discussion, I want to ask that you consider making a, a playing a part in keeping more content like this coming your way by making a small donation. Even $5 goes a long way toward extending and improving our work. So you'll find a donation link in the chat box and in the follow-up emails when, when we send around the recording of today's program. So thank you for that. We have some more uh, uh, webinars coming your way. We have another book discussion on August 5th with Andre Perry, Know Your Price, Valuing Back Black Lives in Property in Black Cities. Um, please join us for that. And then later in the month, we have our walking toward justice kind of part two in Indian country looking at missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and how the built environment can be a part can play a part in the solution for that thank you once again to our speakers and to the co-moderator and to you for spending your time with us today on that we're out thanks <laughs>